Welcome back to This Day Live, the Sunday talk show here on the Arise News Channel. Still with me in the studio, I have Professor Bola Kinterua, Director General, Bolitak Center for International Diplomacy and Strategic Studies. Modele Sharafa Yusuf, veteran broadcast journalist, and Professor David Awurawa, Professor of International Relations and Strategic Studies at the University of Lagos. Now, uh, Professor Akintenwa, let me start with you. Uh, Senator Olubumi Aditumbi talked about the Electoral Act Amendment Bill and issues arising uh, therefrom. And he also talked about the uh, political primaries process in a Kitty state, particularly in his party, the APC, and also the uh, nomination of a card carrying uh, party member as INEC uh, commissioner, and also the APC convention. Uh, if you may comment on some of those issues that he raised. Yeah, I think uh, I should commend uh, Senator Adetumbe. He very calmly addressed all the questions we raised from a constructivist perspective. He tried to justify virtually all that has been done by the APC leaders. As a matter of fact, he gives justification to all that has been done, trying to jettison the observation that there is any crisis of whatever kind within the APC. Um, many of the questions you did ask him clearly showed the reality, the situational reality on the ground. But rather than admitting that such reality existed, he provided alternative explanations that will make um, observers, listeners, to go along his line of reasoning, reasoning that, look, there is nothing like uh, any hula baloo uh, within the framework of the APC. You see, um, when he talks about um, an internal selection process within the APC, that is, his perspective that we have 200 million people in Nigeria are now trying, for instance, now to give the right to every citizen to go to court. His uh, argument is at best, you know, hypothetical. Uh, it is very speculative, though logical. His thinking is that in a country where you have as many as 200 million people, if every citizen is given the right to go to court, to complain, to make a case, it will be unwieldy. Under normal circumstance, it can be true. But the bitter truth in this case is that, look, why should there be limitation, restriction to only contestants, those people who participated in the, in the, in the primaries, to, to go to court? In other words, you, because you have complained, uh, you may have um, a case um, to sustain in the court. But the truth, again, is that those who have not contested can have vested interests. We are looking at uh, a collective in Nigeria, in which case, whatever problem arises, we try to address that one collectively. So. Election is not because you have participated, therefore you have greater interest than those who have not uh, participated. So in this case, uh, I do not share his own um, view there. And um, as to the question, you drew his attention to that he had been in the National Assembly since 1999, etc., all along. I think... Um, uh, he is trying to say 
that it's a matter of a elite that these questions may not affect the ordinary man. So in this case, um, let me just say that to a great extent, I agree with his explanations without necessarily agreeing with the ultimate objective of allowing citizens of Nigeria to partake virtually in the electoral process. Okay, well, quickly, let me come to you, Professor David Awurawa. I'm sure uh, you listened. Uh, Professor David Awurawa. Okay, well, I'll come back to you. Uh, Modele Sharafa, your take on this matter. Well, um, fr from taking the pulse of the people, um, it was clear that more people wanted to get involved in the electoral process from the party level, um, which was why many people were disappointed that uh, the lawmakers in the National Assembly went back on their, they made a vote of face and went back on their threat to veto the, um, to override the president once he uh, declined assent to that bill. Um, so, I mean, it wasn't surprising to me that many people expressed their frustration the way they did. They clearly gave in to the president, regardless of what uh, Senator Ade Tumbi said, but they tried to redeem themselves by inserting that clause on uh, the consensus option. Mm. Um, if there's any credit to be given, it is for defining, because the, the biggest problem that we have in, in the parties is people trying to impose candidates. It's what's caused most of these problems uh, over the years. And, and the National Assembly has tried to define what, how to arrive at a consensus candidate. Um, all the other aspirants must consent. They must withdraw their candidature. Uh, which is good. It goes further in paragraph B to say that where a political party is unable to secure the written consent of all played aspirants for the purpose of a consensus candidate, it shall, it shall resort to the choice of either direct or indirect primaries. That's the most, um, that's the most logical thing to do if you say it, it, we are having a, if, if you say somebody is a consensus candidate and the others say, no, we don't agree, then there's no consensus. There has to be the consensus of everybody for there to be consensus. So that's what's been, been spelled out and, and which is good. Because really at the root of most of the problems that we have in the party is um, internal party democracy or, or lack thereof. Uh, specifically the winner takes all attitude and the strangulating control of the party structures by godfathers or in the case in, as, as, or governors because they're the biggest four guys, they're the people that people talk about most these days because they have the most, they, they're the leaders of the parties in, in their different states. Uh, it's interesting to note, though, that some of those people now crying foul were either beneficiaries of godfatherism when the going was good, or, okay. or, or they were, or, or they were <laughs> themselves, no, 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 or they were themselves <laughs> guilty of yes, imposition and overbearing influence on the party <laughs> when, when they held sway. So, so, so I, I find that very uh, funny. I find that very funny. The most important lesson, though, in all of this is, is that is for politicians to provide for and allow a bottom-up approach to taking decisions in the party. Uh, every, every member every member should be carried along, as they say, in politics, uh, and they should allow and ensure internal distribution of power at the different levels. The minimum set of, 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 of norms are rules and procedures I give. You ordinary are, you members. are saying that Buhari should sign the reward bill, you know, as it is, which is quite good. Yeah, I'm hoping... Since I'm you are hoping. advocating uh, at least consensus as an issue, Cons I think uh, I'm, I'm, this president should just sign this in rather than... Uh, so we can move forward. Yes. So we can move forward. Yes. Uh, well, it, well it, is the, it is the lesser of the two evils. We, we, most people, from what we gathered, wanted direct primary so they can be, they, so they can be involved. All the are good but, when... But now we are, they have said, okay, well, we are conceding to the president. Let us uh, move. The most engaging models of... Uh, internal party democracy, uh, uh, in inclusive, participatory, and exactly. include fair, fair distribution of power. So we need to uh, keep that in mind so that uh, we can move forward. I, I, 
Ruben is saying round up, round up. So I'm, I'm rounding. <laughs> I'm rounding up. Over, over. No, I'm just trying to manage time because I, you know I, Aaron right. Akrejola is right. waiting for us out I, there in uh, Cameroon to give us, uh, you know, a briefing on uh, today's half confinement. But Professor David Awurawo, let me come to you uh, very briefly. Your take on some of the issues we've been discussing so far. Well, um, I agree with uh, Professor Akitani and uh, Modeli that uh, the president should sign this um, bill into law so we can move on from there. Senator Dayton said uh, all those are work in progress. The um, law, when it comes to law, is put into, into uh, you know, practice. We'll be able to identify what flaws there, there are and then moving forward, those laws can be, you know, corrected. Amendments, you know, can take place again moving forward and can be corrected. But like we said before, the bill has so many good things that uh, some issues here and there, some few flaws here and there should not make, uh, you know, us insist on those things so that the president will not sign. So this week will be interesting. I will, I will imagine that the president will sign this week. So let's see how the week goes. And uh, when it comes to law, we'll put it into practice. And uh, we will we'll be able to improve, you know, our electoral process and by extension, uh, democratic, uh, you know, uh, uh, development. As for Ikiti, well, everybody cannot be governor. Only one person can be governor at the same time. If the process that leads to the uh, uh, primaries and uh, whoever emerges is fairly transparent, the rest you just take it with philosophical calmness and uh, support their party and move on. All these unending litigations, somebody is, has moved to Africa and all that. It, it is suggestive of, oh, I must be the one there. But of course, some of them may have legitimate grants that maybe the elections were not fair and all that. So uh, we can give it to them. But people should, I mean, this, this has become too uh, pervasive in the Nigerian political system, such that if an election is held, one person does not make it and... He wants to put the roof down. Everything turns topsy turvy. Uh, I think they should make first be fair, and when that is done, you know, members who lose out should accept the results, support the whoever has uh, you know, emerged, and then uh, put ahead. Um, those those are my thoughts on that. Of course, the issue of uh, um, consensus candidate we've talked about that, but that that provision that Modeli talked about is important. A written, you know, uh, um, a written statement by all interested in the position that they have consented. That is critical. Let us see how those uh, big wigs manipulate it with that provision, you know, moving forward. And of course, uh, regarding that, finally, regarding the issue of uh, whether nobody can go to court except those who uh, participate in the, in the, I think that's the mistake by the, uh, you know, uh, by the House of Assembly. They should have left that as it was. 200 million Nigerians have never gone to court to contest uh, you know, certificate or other things they find, uh, you know, inappropriate. It's only a few who know who have been doing it, and it has worked. In cases you cited when you were discussing with uh, Senator Aditumbi, that was the mistake. We hope that moving forward, we will revert back to what it was before, such that anybody that sees anything that is inappropriate can, you know, approach the courts, and they will clean up the system. That is how democracy grows elsewhere, and Nigeria cannot be an exception. Okay, thank you, Professor Aurawa. On that note, let's take another short break before we go to Cameroon to talk to Aaron Akarejola. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Visit Live, the Sunday talk show here on the Arise News Channel. Still with me in the studio, Professor Bola Akinterwa, Modele Sharafa Yusuf, and Professor David. Our next subject. Mohamed Salah is looking to lead the North Africans to a record extending eighth continental triumph, while red teammate Sadio Mane hopes to play a part in Senegal's first ever Nations Cup victory. The Teranga Lions have lost both finals they have played in 2002 and 2019, while Egypt are looking to leave the trophy for the first time since 2010. While the spotlight will fall on two stars of the Premier League, the two sides have had contrasting parts to the final, which will be played in the Cameroonian capital, Yaoundé. The two forwards, both 29 and with over 100 goals in the English top flight, 
helped Liverpool win the Champions League in 2018-2019 season and then end a 30-year wait for a league title a year later. Egypt and Senegal had already been drawn to face each other in March in a two-legged playoff for a spot at the World Cup in Qatar. The continental silverware is at stake first. Mane has scored three goals and set up another two in Senegal's run, despite suffering a concussion in a last 16 match with Cape Verde, while Salah has two goals and one assist. Found on the spot update of the build-up to this showpiece event, we are now being joined from Yaoundé by Arai Sports correspondent Aaron Akirejola, Aaron the Baron. Good to have you on this live. Yes. Thank you very much. I see you are, you are, you are battle ready. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> tell us, yes, I am. what is the situation in uh, Yaoundé, at the Olembe uh, Stadium? What is the mood? Uh, is it one of excitement or what? Over to you. Uh, yes, I must actually tell you, Doctor, quite a number of people are just in front of me, all right, just behind my camera here, trying to get into the stadium. They are all lining up and trying to keep a formation as they get into the stadium. While behind me uh, is the VIP park, of course, you can just see the Olympic Stadium just right behind me there. And I must say this, first of all, the gates are open. And that is very instructive because when CAF and the Cameroon government actually met in regards to what happened on the 24th of this month, um, 24th of last month in January, it was that at the moment that um, the Cameroon their government will abide by some changes that the CAF had actually made to security. And now, as you speak, all gates and all entrances are actually open for the free flow of traffic and movement of people to ensure that what happened, the disaster that happened, will be averted. But it's not, the attendance will not be as as astronomical or will not be seen the numerical strength we would have seen if it was Cameroon playing in the final. We know that Cameroon played yesterday at the Amateur Aido Stadium. We were there yesterday. They actually won on penalties, five goals, three, and the stadium was fast. I barely 15,000 people came for that particular fixture, and it was very poor. And this time around, we'll be expecting maybe um, just maybe shy, shy of 30,000 people. We know that this 54,000 seater can actually hold more, but the appetite for football in terms of watching these live at the stadiums have not been really, really high. The time they tried to galvanize people, which was back on the 24th, the, un um, the unthinkable happened. A dark cloud just came over African football. Now they're trying to um, take that away. They're trying to ensure that does not repeat itself. And they are as much as possible. So they curtailed the number of people that should have attend this particular stadium. Well, uh, what in your opinion makes this uh, final special? Is it the fact that we have two Liverpool superstars, Sadio Mane and Mohamed Salah? Is this Mane versus Salah and a Liverpool uh, moment? Or there are other reasons why this final is special? Um, the final is special for a couple of reasons. These are the best players we have in Africa, as we speak, based on, based on current form, based on achievements, based on the pedigree, because these are they play in some of the uh, they play in Liverpool, which is one of the biggest clubs, which is one of the most informed teams in the world, and they've been turning heads time and time again for um, the uh, club side. The Reds, talking about Liverpool, the cup has enjoyed the very best at the slicky nature of Sadio Mane and Mohamed Salah. They are feisty nature. They've all enjoyed that. It's not time for African football to actually enjoy the same thing. And I must actually tell you that everyone that is coming to watch, is it a Mohamed Salah supporter or a Sadio Mane supporter, we know that Senegal and the Alouis side are blessed with an abundance of talent for men who plays for Chelsea, not forgetting Cheka Kuyete, who plays for Crystal Palace, and, and a flurry of players. They have some of the best legs in African football. And if you look at this on the team sheet, you will be teaming um, Senegal to actually win it. But we North Africans are always crafty, always crafty. And as a matter of fact, they are even major predictions. A particular prophet has even said an Arab nation will be winning tournaments. And a particular number 10 will be scoring the goal and ensuring that he helps us win the tournament. So at the, at the moment, 
the appetite to see Mohamed Salah go against Sadio Mane cannot be overstated. Well, what's your prediction uh, about how this um, uh, match will end? I know that Egypt are the favourites, uh, you know, in the view of the uh, bookmakers. But we have seen in this tournament countries like Comoros, Senegal, and Cape Verde, you know, and Burkina Faso, you know, putting up very spirited uh, efforts. And this is the first time Senegal is getting to the final back-to-back. -back. Who are you supporting? I am keeping the Terrega Lions of Senegal to actually pick this one, understanding that if you look at how things have actually played out in your introduction, you mentioned that in 2002, in, 20, in 2019, and this time around, they've actually made it to the finals. One thing has been very, uh, one thing has been very instructive, which has been the fact that Alice C. the coach of the side, was a player back in 2002, was a coach in 2019, and I'm hoping that that's the third time will be a lucky champ for him and he will be able to make something happen. I'm hoping so because the truth is this, it will be quite disappointing. It will be quite disastrous if he has actually touched this particular team, talking about more important things, this golden generation of uh, the Taranga Lions of Senegal will have some of the very best players of Africa in the diaspora and yes, they've ended up with nothing. They are coming to their peak, talking about the likes of Mohamed Salah, Tekekuyati, Mendy, not forgetting the glory of all those that have actually, that are actually part of that particular setup. They've seen glory at individual levels, and they make it as a collective unit. The Terenga Lions have suffered that break. It's about time they actually pick up that particular gong. But the question is this, 90 minutes separates them. Who wants to the most will determine, at the end of the day, who actually picks it up. And a bit of luck, just a bit of luck. Well, Aaron, before uh, we let you go, I'd like to ask you, for you, what are the main highlights of this uh, tournament so far? And what lessons uh, have we learned uh, beyond the uh, special high moment of uh, having a female referee for the first time, uh, the Rwanda, uh, Salima Mukasanga? You know, I think there are other issues. Over to you. Uh, of course, Mukasanga was um, a very, very nice gloss to what seems to be a coming of age of African football. But I must actually say that some of the high points of this particular event has actually been the fact that we've seen um, people um, come to this nation because the truth was this. They were taught just before this edition stop that um, Cameroon and Africa do not have the capacity to host the nation's cup in a COVID-19 pandemic era. And we've and the and what Cameroon and CAF have actually done is to shock the entire world. Because I must tell you, the battery of tests I've actually done from the first day I landed in Cameroon to this afternoon has been countless. Every single turn, you actually see people, you actually see testing made available free of charge. I must actually say, it's, it's not been, you're not being charged for it. And that shows that we can handle ourselves and we've not seen any major outbreak and we've seen good organization. We've seen stadiums of the highest quality. Some have let some have let us down, but I must actually say that ultimately, ultimately, it's been a good show piece. We've seen goals galore. We've seen the very good, the very bad, the very ugly. That has been the Nations Cup in summary. Well, thank you very much, Aaron Akirejola. We've been told that today's final is bound to be exciting. Some people say it's scintillating, uh, you know, match that we should uh, expect. We hope that the final match will live up to that billing. Thank you very much for joining us on This Day Live. Okay, well, I think we're lucky. We have uh, Modili Sharafas Yusuf in the studio, and you are a veteran uh, sports uh, analyst. What's your take? Let me uh, savour that old moment of Modele Sharafa Yusuf reporting sports. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, uh, it's 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 um, a good feeling. You know, every time I watch people like Aaron Akirejola, you know, it brings back the excitement, the butterflies um, when you're going on air and, and there's a match to be played. Uh, it, it's clearly those 17 and a half years as a sports correspondent were the best years of my professional life. I can assure you that. Uh, so I still save all those moments. Oh, I, I, that said. Uh, this is going to be an interesting match, without any doubt. Um, Senegal has a reputation as the best country to have never won 
the African Cup of Nations. Uh, this is their second successful final, as we have, uh, as we have said, and their third overall. Uh, they lost the tournament in 2019 to Algeria by 0-1, very slim margin, and they lost the uh, 2002 final to Cameroon on penalty. So it's always been a, a slim margin until uh, the 2000s. Cameroon, um, Senegal were just an average West African team. But they began to surge in the 2000s with uh, notable players like El Haji Diouf, Keita Diaw, uh, and, and Demba Ba more recently. And now uh, Sadio Mani, who, who's the African Footballer of the Year 2020. Uh, uh, they have continued to grow in leaps and bounds and they've continued to do well even though they haven't been lucky at the african cup of nations i'm rooting for senegal but i'm also conscious of the fact that um, they're up against a very good team a, a historically good team uh, egypt ha are the most successful african country in the african cup of nations they have appeared in uh, 23 or so of the tournaments out of the 35, and uh, they have done well. Uh, they've hosted the Nations Cup uh, five times, winning it three times as hosts. Mm. And you know, they've also won seven times, including the first and second editions. Every time they get, more importantly, more importantly to note is that every time Egypt gets to the final, they win it. Mm. Except in 1962 when they won silver. They're either in the final to win or they're not. So they've won seven times. They've been in the final eight times, and they've won seven times. This is their ninth final. So um, use that information anyhow you will. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Modele, for that uh, very interesting and detailed background. Professor David Awarawa, let me come to you, because I don't imagine that uh, Professor Akintenewa is into football. OK, OK, Professor Awarawa is not there. We lost connection with him. So, Prof, you football. <laughs> Modele concluded on the note that Egypt had been doing very well. She posited that the moment Egypt gets to the final stage, they normally win, except 1962 or something like that, when um, they got- When they uh, won silver, 1962. Now, I want to theorize in the name of God Almighty, that Egypt, all right, should lose to Senegal. My take is for Senegal. And the basic reason is that I am looking at the issue from a geopolitical perspective. There are three regions involved in this uh, African Cup of Nations. West Africa, North Africa, Central Africa. Central Africa is the host region. The competitors are from West Africa and uh, North Africa. So in this case, because um, Egypt can claim African status, nationality, citizenship at one time, at another time as an Arab nation, not African. So when we are talking about an African uh, football match or competition, let the winner always be a true African state. And as to the question raised by uh, Ruben, he asked Aaron the question on what makes the this year's uh, uh, final competition special. And uh, the argument of the two best uh, African players are participating. I think that there are more cogent reasons that uh, explain this aspect of special. He to drew attention to the fact that for the first time we are having a female referee. That makes it special. Another um, factor is that um, we are having Senegal representing West Africa. We are having Egypt representing North Africa. It's an interregional competition. 
is not at the level of a state to state. So when you begin to look at all these critical factors, they become very special. But I pray that we celebrate Senegal today. Okay, Prof. Uh, well, the only thing to uh, say in response to your point is I'm not sure that there are fake African countries in the African <laughs> Union. So it will be uh, a bit uh, it is of the mark to say whether some African countries it who are is, members of the AU are is, true or fake. That is one level of analysis. Okay. The issue okay. is not uh, but, talking about fake countries. We are talking well, about people who no, are really... You use the word that uh, Egypt is not exactly a true African country. But let me go straight well, to Professor... Well, we will come Professor, to that one. Yeah, mm -hmm. let me go to Professor Awurawo. Professor Awurawo, are you there? Okay, your take very quickly on today's African Cup of Nations final between Egypt and Senegal and the uh, tournament so far. Yes, I'm here. Uh, Egypt uh, is an authentic African state. Uh, Egypt is even a contestant for a permanent place in the United Nations uh, Security Council to represent Africa, which also Nigeria and South Africa are also, you know, contesting. But that is, by the way, as far as the um, Nations Cup is concerned, um, um, of course, from a geopolitical point of view, and as West Africans, one would wish that uh, Senegal will win. But beyond that, um, Senegal played final twice before, 92, and then most recently, that is uh, the very last uh, edition against uh, Algeria. And then uh, this is your third uh, uh, shot in the final. Um, on, the, on the balance of play, I think, uh, I don't think Egypt deserves to win this final. Um, when one looks at all their matches, you know, extra time, the penalties and all that. Senegal has been more solid. But that's not to say that Egypt cannot win it. There is uh, this element of good fortune, you know, in everything, including football. Um, so why we wish, or why I hope that Senegal will win, one cannot rule out uh, Egypt uh, in this. The same way they, I mean, some of the best, better teams have even gone home. Nigeria has gone home. Cote d'Ivoire has gone home. Cameroon has gone home. You know, any of these three could easily have, you know, won the won the won the call if they qualify for final. So, but from the on the basis of their performance up to now, Senegal seems the better. I don't know anybody who's saying that uh, Egypt, why is Egypt favored? Egypt this has not been as solid as Senegal, but of course, in the final, anything is possible. And as Modele observed, of their nine finals, they won seven of them. And so when they get to final, they tend to win. So but we hope that uh, Senegal will rise up to the occasion today and uh, win AFCON for the first time. Remember, they had the excitement in 2002 when they went to World Cup. Their first World Cup, you know, they got to quarterfinals, one of the few African countries that have ever done so. So um, we wish both of them well, but to my mind, I hope Senegal will win today. At least they have AFCON for the first time. Okay, thank you, Professor Awurawa. Let's move on quickly to another very interesting subject. President Mohamed Buhari has launched the revised national policy on population for sustainable development, stressing the need for urgent measures to address Nigeria's high fertility rate through expanding access to modern contraceptive methods nationwide. The president also inaugurated the National Council on Population Management, chaired by him and Vice President Yemi Oshibajo as deputy chairman with heads of relevant ministries, departments, and agencies as members. On the document, President Buhari said its overall goal is to improve the quality of life and standards of living of all Nigerians, being one of the major aspirations of the current administration. Well, Modele Sharafa Yusuf, revised national population policy. It didn't work in 1988, it didn't work in 2004, what is the guarantee that it will work in 2021? Uh, we want to revise population policy. We don't even know how many we are in this country. There are two different issues. We don't know how many we are. Yes. That's one issue. But we do know that we are many. <laughs> <laughs> Nigeria is said to be, we don't know the exact number. That's, that's, that's that. We don't okay. know the exact number. You know, okay. it depends on who you're talking to. Uh, between 180 to 220 million. We don't know because the last time a census was conducted was 16 years ago. And uh, uh, normally it should be at least every 10 years a census is conducted. So that's the reason we don't know. Even that 
last census of 2006 was disputed, so we're not sure. So uh, that said, we believe from the um, extrapolations, from the estimations that Nigeria is currently the seventh most populous country in the world. And that if we keep going at this rate, Nigeria will be the fourth most populous country by 2050. Correct. Uh, it's mind boggling. And, you know, the population has always been high in Nigeria and the fertility rate has always been high, with the typical Hausa Fulani woman having about eight children. The typical Igbo woman would have about five children. And the lowest is the typical Yoruba woman. We're just using the three, uh, uh, the three main ethnic tribes. Uh, the, the typical Yoruba woman having like four children. We have been told that Kasina has the highest fertility rate among the states and Lagos has the lowest. Uh, clearly, uh, the difference between these two states would be educational levels. Uh, and in most cases, the, the, what tends to uh, determine how many children a woman has uh, would be education, occupation uh, prevalence, and the, the age at which a woman starts having children and religion. Uh, you know, when a, a woman starts having children, and this tends to happen a lot in the North, when a woman starts having children at a younger age, the, the younger they start, the more children they're likely to have. And this goes back to education, because when a girl child is not educated, what's, what's there to do? You go and get married and, and start having children. And then the occupation that, that is prevalent in, in a certain area, when there are more farmers, for example, people who are involved in agriculture, they want to have more children to help them on the farms. So this has tended to um, make the fertility rate in the north higher than these issues of education, occupational prevalence, and age. I've tended to make uh, uh, the, the fertility rate higher in the north. Another thing is re religion. But we have found out that many people, uh, um, Catholics, for example, they frown at, con at contraception. So the rate of birth among Catholic women in the Southeast is even higher than the rate of, than the Igbo average. You know, and then for, for Muslims, uh, there's this often misquoted or misapplied or misunderstood um, saying of the prophet that Muslims should have more women, should have more children to populate the religion. That is something that people have often hidden under. But you know, they, 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 they forget that uh, the prophet himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, had said that times will determine the interpretation of some of the practices as recommended in the hadiths. And that in most of the um, many majority countries, fertility rates have actually dropped. You know, because uh, in Indonesia, in Iran, United Arab Emirates, Turkey, Tunisia, Lebanon, the fertility rate is dropping. And especially in Iran, where uh, after the wars, it was re they realized that, you know, this is not sustainable. We can't keep breeding at this level. So um, they also try to tell people, and I think that's one thing we should, also, with the, the, this new thing should tell people that you should have children you can take care of and, the and, and that you can educate, which is what uh, Isla Islam preaches. Okay, quickly, uh, Professor David Aurawa, population control, contraceptives, family planning, expanding Nigerian population, population developing at a higher rate uh, than GDP. Um, and now the Buhari administration wants to tackle that. Yes, uh, it's the right policy and it's the right way to go. Modele began by saying that we don't know how many we are, but we are many. I want to make an addendum and say, we don't know how many we are, but we are very many. You know, population issues, you know, are, are not determined just by landmass. People say, oh, see a landmass, 930, 920-something thousand square kilometers and all that. No, it's in relation to resources. In fact, what the president uh, has tried, is trying to do and what we tried to do in 1988, 2004, is Malthusian. You look at your by resources vis-a-vis -vis your population and see how you know you you bring the two together uh, the china had a one-time one policy for you know a couple of decades 
now because they see they are, they have, you know, reckon that their population uh, vis-a-vis their, uh, you know, structure of their economy and all that, they are not in tandem. They have revised that policy. So it's, it's the right thing to do. It's the right way to go. Um, I think uh, the resources we have are inadequate, you know, for the huge population. Some of these problems we have had in recent times, banditry and the rest, are linked to this. When people give birth to children, they don't go to school, they don't have uh, the way without to take, them, they, uh, take care of themselves. As uh, the scholar Edward Azar said, these needs are ontological and non-negotiable. And people can now resort to anything, any means to try to meet their basic needs. So it is the right thing to do, the right way to go. But we lead, like in your introduction, you said in 1988, we couldn't quite uh, succeed. 2004, we couldn't quite succeed. What are the indications now that in 2022 will be successful? Well, let us just try. Because you know, these things are not things you can arrest anybody for. You cannot say, oh, you, the person has broken the law, you take the person to court and the person go to jail. You can only persuade, you can only give reasons why people should do, you know, people should have children they can take care of. So the advocacy should start now and the measures should be taken to pursue the logical conclusion. I, I do not think that will they succeed excellently, but I think that it will help us to reduce our population to some extent, at least, and that will be good for the country uh, generally. So the policy is the right thing. Is, I mean, and it's also good that our president is from the north, where there is this skepticism regarding whether oh the president doesn't want to is not bringing the policy that will bring the population down and make them to become disadvantaged uh, during elections. The president from Casino State, one of the states with the highest you know birth rates. So I'm sure with him there, there will be more confidence in the policy, and that will help us to at least bring our population to something more reasonable in line with our resources. So our we'll prof, very quickly, before we go to Russia and Ukraine to talk about the tensions there. Again, for reasons of uh, psychology of human differences, I do not share the argument of Professor Awurao and uh, Madeli. I, I cannot find any goodness in the policy of, uh, of the government. Is the problem really Fertility control or incapacity of government to provide for increase in population. In this case, countries that are more populous than Nigeria, do we have, do they have the type of banditry we are facing in Nigeria? There are only six countries that are more populous than Nigeria. Those six countries, do you have Boko Haramism? Do you have banditry? Do you have all? the political recklessness in Nigeria there, they don't. Please, you see, there is beauty in an increasing population. Something must make you great and greater. If Madele talks about many that we are, and uh, David is talking about very many, please, from a religious perspective, from the Christian perspective, the Yoruba version of um, King James says, Ma BC is Ma Resi, that is continue to procreate. Go ye and multiply. You cannot be more correct. <laughs> so you cannot act for me. You see, officially, the policy of the federal government of Nigeria, you can have many wives, but in terms of um, entitlement allowance, they provide for only one. Wife. Children, too, they provide for only four. So, in this case, the policy is already there. And if anybody, the, the policy, if, you're, if, you're if you have religion, me, uh, uh, Islam preaches responsible parenting. I, am not, I, I, I did say that even Islam says, you know, have more people, more, have more children to populate the ummah. But it also, at the same time, preaches responsible parenting. Meaning, you should have the number of children that you can cater for and that you can educate. Islamic perspective is very valid. So, so, so what we are if saying this here, country <clears throat> cannot provide for the two hundred and. Uh, 220 why, million why, that we are. Why, why should we continue to procreate and uh, why is the breed, government uh, and breed not like able rats? to provide for 200 million? No, because you the see, resources are finite. The, no, is, is, if for instance have... <laughs> all the money that are being looted everywhere, 
They are diverted into training children, etc. all along. This problem will not be there. Anyway, okay, interesting perspectives. Let's take our final topic for the day. And we have just about six, seven minutes to go. Russia has assembled about 70% of the military capability needed for a full-scale invasion of Ukraine in the coming weeks. And that's according to American officials. The ground is expected to freeze and harden from mid-February, enabling Moscow to bring in more heavy equipment, the unnamed official said. Russia is said to have more than 100,000 troops near Ukraine's borders, but denies planning to attack. The U.S. officials did not provide evidence for their assessment. They said the information was based on intelligence, but that they were unable to give details due to its sensitivity, U.S. media report. The officials also said they did not know if Russian President Vladimir Putin had decided to take such a step, adding that a diplomatic solution was still possible. According to reports, the officials warned that a Russian invasion of Ukraine could cause as many as 50,000 civilian deaths. They also estimated that an attack could see the Ukrainian capital fall within days and prompt a refugee crisis in Europe as millions of people flee. Well, Prof, let me come to you uh, quickly. What exactly does Putin want beyond saying Ukraine cannot be a member of NATO? What is he afraid of? And how would this distort the balance uh, of geopolitics and also of the security structure in Europe? You need to go back to history. When the Soviet Union came up with the idea of uh, perestroika, openness, Russia and Ukraine it used to be main constituents of the Soviet Union. And when there was a break, Ukraine became autonomous, independent. Russia that took over, that inherited the international status of uh, the Soviet Union, does not want Ukraine to be independent. Why? Because Ukraine decided to now ally with the Western world. The Western world now is trying to completely westernize the environmental conditionings of Ukraine. And Russia doesn't like that at all. In this case, we are in a situation where, for instance, the whole world is um, going along the line of the little man and the fat man, that is Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Because, as it is, with um, the massing of uh, Russian troops, the borders with um, Ukraine, it is just sufficient for a minor mistake on either side. And then we all people will be in trouble. Okay, Professor Awarawa, Russia, Ukraine tensions. Uh, very quickly, we have just about two, three minutes to go. Well, um, it is very concerning what's happening in that uh, part of the world. Um, what, um, what is that uh, a war has not broken out until now, and we are hoping that uh, the diplomacy that uh, is ongoing now will gain momentum and pre prevent the outbreak of war. We know what the consequences will be if and when the war does break out in that, in that area. Uh, our advice has been that uh, Putin should be more reasonable. It is true that uh, no country will want uh, enemies around. But again, you have to balance that with the alternative of a war. If a war does break out, what, what, what will Russia gain from it? I mean, will that not make uh, Ukraine to uh, uh, stop its, uh, uh, you know, not to be an independent or sovereign state anymore. So Russia has to balance its desire not to have enemies around with how to get that, you know, done. So in the diplomacy that is going on, we we'll expect, uh, you know, uh, uh, reasonableness and concessions on both sides to prevent a war. We all know what the consequences will be if a war does break out, you know, as as. Uh, uh, Arms are being uh, amassed around. 
and their troops are being deployed. We know what the U.S. has done over the week, uh, you know, deploying, strengthening its capacity in, uh, in Eastern Europe so that if a war does break out, you know, they can come in. Uh, we hope that the diplomacy that is ongoing now will gain momentum and the war will prevent it. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Aurawa. Well, Modile, I, I don't know whether you still have a word on this, but, you know, we seem to have uh, run out of time. So thank you, uh, Modile Sharafa Yusuf. Thank you, uh, Professor Bola Kintanrawa. And thank you very much, Professor David Aurawa. You've been watching This Day Live, the Sunday talk show, here on Arise News. I'm Ruben Abati. For my entire team here in Lagos, it's bye for now, and thank you very much for watching. We'll see you again next Sunday.